bull sharks or just bull? Um, my name is Hal, I'm your host. We're going to go through the bull shark, the history of the bull shark being in fresh water, where they've been seen in fresh water, supposed fresh water, um, the source for the history of them. So we're going to take and go through Lake Nicaragua and that's going to be show by show. There's a lot we're going to have to cover with Lake Nicaragua because that's like the granddaddy of them all to, to prove that nothing was proven in that lake and I can do that. Um, I'm going to go through and shoot down some water sources. People will assume, I even assumed, I mean, I, you know, I listen to the same stuff everybody else does. So all the examples of sharks and fresh water are, I know all those. I'm just looking at the waters, looking at how they could be proven one way or the other that they're in there. The best way would be, you know, a stomach full of fish, you know, freshwater fish species, but that's never happened. So, um, didn't come about this in a weird way, a little bit of background. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a marine biologist, I'm, you know, somebody that uh, loves shark attacks and I have a shark attack channel called Sharks Happen and in this channel I have one episode of my viewers that asked me to do an episode on freshwater brackish water attacks. So I started up and I was all set to do a series just on freshwater attacks and once I got into it, I couldn't find any. I mean, I found three supposedly in Lake Nicaragua. One is an April Fool's joke from 1944. It reads as one. The other two are from 1850 and before. So uh, they're not real credible. And um, everything I've looked into in that in that episode, I had said that you know either either these bull sharks are not in the fresh water, or they're hiding attacks. Because if they're in the fresh water, they're going to be around people and attack them. I don't care what anybody says. So I was wondering about that, but now I'm 100% sure they're not in fresh water. At least that's my opinion, and I'll show you why I think that when we go through this. Um, today I'm going to go through a really quick update on the people that actually saw sharks in Lake Nicaragua uh, up until the first actual study by somebody trained in 1864 at Gunther. So, um, the presence of the sharks and sawfish, they also had large, te large tooth sawfish in, in that lake. Um, I don't know if they're still there, but they were there. Uh, presence of sharks and sawfish in the lake in San Juan, known since Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo uh, y Valdez. Uh, he mentioned both in the lake. He called the he called the um, the sawfish. Um, a fish with a, a sword coming out of its nose that protrudes up and it has individual teeth coming off that. So I don't have any doubt that he saw that. The sharks he saw, however, I doubt that he saw sharks. Um, we're going to get into the first scientific studies of this in a, in a brief description of the shark that the man saw in 1864 and how that turned into a bull shark 100 years later. Um, then in 1852, so that was 1526, that, that uh, Fernando went over, Gonzalez for, Gonzalo Fernandez went over there. So 1526, he goes over there and says he saw him. In 1852, so this is uh, 300 years later, <laughs> Squire, he's a U.S. minister uh, to Nicaragua, so a politician sent over there. And he says, sharks abound in the lake called tigrones for their rapacity, not tiburones, it's calling them tigrones. So the people there aren't even calling them what they call sharks. Um, he has seen them from the castle, he says he saw them himself dashing about from the castle with fins protruding above the water. Um, the shark that's explained later on is a dogfish, a small dogfish. You wouldn't be able to see that from up on a tower where he's talking about. What you would be able to see is tarpon. And tarpon are, are in that lake. They're in that lake to this day. If you, if you go ahead and you look up Lake Nicaragua and you try to see a bull shark, even on their own pages, they have a bull shark, but it'll have a remora stuck to it. They can't live in a lake. They need, they need currents. They need, that can't be possible. So they're not even using freshwater bull sharks in their pictures for being in that lake. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Right there we get to him in uh, Square. After that it's 1864 and we're going to get into Gunther and his work on the fishes that were in Lake Nicaragua. We'll also get into uh, Gill and Bransford, which are the next ones that looked into it about 20 years after he did. And there wasn't much happened for 60 years until 
a professor in Nebraska got involved and changed everything up. And we'll look at just how he did that. And I think sloppy, sloppy work, at least by his report of his summary of his uh, study. There's a lot of questions I have as to why certain things are the way they are. And I think you'll, you'll agree with it. So that leaves us. We're going to end this here with Gunther. Uh, we'll pick up on Gunther, the first trained person to look into the fishes at Lake Nicaragua. And now we're going to step over to the whiteboard where we're going to deal with the Breed River where a monster was pulled out of the river and it was supposedly fresh water. We'll take a look at that. Okay, a quick look at the Breed River. Um, all water started out as, as fresh water. None of it started out as salt. The oceans, they, they collected their salt from the ground, from busted up rocks, from other sources. Uh, underwater, probably salt mines like there are, like in Lake Penoir, and turn that lake, freshwater lake, into a, a saltwater lake. A huge saltwater lake. If that uh, interesting video, you should watch that. But uh, they all start out as salt and, and as, as fresh water, and the salt is added. Um, rivers and lakes, they they have a evaporation limit. So they do they evaporate more water, fresh water, than they get in return. So are they getting less fresh water? If a, if a lake is a river is getting less fresh water in than it's evaporating, it is turning saltier. Um, if it's the other way around, it's staying fresh water. Uh, fresh water, we'll start out here, a thousand parts per million, so a thousand parts per million of the uh, uh, million parts of uh, water has a thousand parts uh, of salt, salinity in it. Um, the salinity is made up of other things, it isn't just a, a salt factor, there's, there's chlorides, there's uh, hard carbonates, or things like that that add to it too. Fresh, Fresh water, a lot of them say it's under 500. The Mississippi is 340 parts per million. So you can drink that water. Um, you can drink the lakes, you know, in Michigan where I live, you can drink the water out of them. It's not a problem. Uh, a thousand is where they stop, they cut off from being able to use drinking water in the U.S. I, drinking water in the U.S. is about 20 parts per million, but um, we're just going by a thousand parts per million for the fresh water cutoff instead of 500. Um, 1,000 to 10,000 is mild brackish water, 10,000 to 20,000 is moderate brackish water, and 20 to 30 is heavy brackish water. And seawater is 30 to 35,000 parts per million. It's mostly 35,000, but 30,000 is where seawater starts in parts per million. So, we have studies, 1989, hydrology, this is the name of it, you can, you can Google this. Hydrology and salinity dynamics of the Breed River in South Africa. Um, it says that it acts as a receiver of significant amounts of saline irrigation return flow. So they're getting a bunch of return flow. This thing's 330 miles long, 30, 330 kilometers long. At the top, the, at the base of it, there's a, a dam, and um, they're saying that it, it's getting this irrigation return flow. So they say that in order to guarantee sufficient quality at the last abstraction point, which is at Weir 5, Weir 5 from the ocean here is 80 kilometers, more than 80 kilometers from the ocean. And in order for them to get quality water at the last abstraction point, back in 1989, they had to do dumps from the freshwater dam to be able to make that water usable 80, 80 kilometers up from the ocean. Uh, seasonal behavior, uh, salinity peaks in the summer due to lack of fresh water and inflow from saline uh, irrigation return flow. So in the summer it's, it's, it's at its highest as far as salinity. Um, we have another one, the Breed River Basin study. The basin is this right here and it's also called an estuary. And those are salt water, salt water. they are not fresh water. Um, um, first, we'll get to a 1981 study, the Breed River Estuary, a historical perspective on hydrology, geomorphology, and sedimentology. That's the name of the article. Uh, station 2. So they have these stations. Station 1, where they measured salinity, is at the ocean, at the opening. Station 2 is 11 kilometers up from the ocean, and 25 kilometers is going to matter. Uh, they did a study, and they have a brackish water here. They checked for 30, 20,000, and 10,000. Now, they did the parts per thousand, so it was 1 through 35, but we're doing a million because that's what I like to use. 
Um, so 30,000 in normal flows, June, January through March, this is without the drought, normal flows of the river. They found that solidity from the mouth um, at 30, so we're talking seawater. How far does the seawater go? Maximum it went 9 kilometers. Seawater. The average they don't know. The average could be anywhere from 5, 7, it could be anywhere in there. They don't know the average because they didn't check every little spot going up the river. But they know that at the heaviest, the seawater will push up 9 kilometers up into that water, up into that thing. Now tides do this. And this is tides work alone because when the current is working with the tide, these numbers jump. Um, so that's seawater going to nine kilometers. And that happens twice a day at least because you have two two tides, two high, two high tides and two low tides per day. Um, next we'll go to mild brackish water, and that's twenty. So twenty thousand, still closer to seawater than it is to to fresh water. And that has gone on an average 12. 12 kilometers, the max is 14. And that means that the low would be right around 10 kilometers off of the watt. Now that's 20,000 parts per million. You'd be able to taste the salt, no problem there, I guarantee it. And that's going 12 to 14 kilometers and 10 kilometers at the low. And this is without the help of any currents. Then we get into mild brackish water, 1,000 to 10,000, they're checking just 10,000. Um, 10,000, they checked that and they just went to where the background melted in with the 1,000. So what they did was they went as far as they could until it's dropped to 1,000 salinity. That goes all the way to 25. 25 kilometers, brackish water going off of there every day, twice a day, just high tides. Now there's low tide and there's what they call uh, uh, slack low tide. So two lowest tides, this station two, which is 11 kilometers from the ocean, gets down to 6,000 and 8,000. That's the lowest this will get is 6,000, 8,000, 11 kilometers from the ocean. Never gets any cleaner than that as far as fresh water. Fresh water still we're calling it 1,000 when some people say it's less than 500. It's, this gets to 6,000 at the least. Now, uh, December through April, when they're not having normal flows, they're holding off this dam water and they're using it for irrigation. That's how this all gets saltier as they're holding that off from being able to come down there. On average, the seawater during the drought months, so you're talking December through April, on average it goes to nine kilometers nine kilometer average and then it goes up to 11 so seawater is going nine kilometers and 11 kilometers the, the 20 million 20,000 parts per million is going all the way up to 15 on average so up here 15 with a maximum of 20 so you got real heavy brackish water going all the way up 20 kilometers from the ocean. Uh, the mild brackish water will go up to 31 kilometers max. So this goes even further, 31 kilometers. Now they found bull sharks, and I've seen the video, and that one was located 33 kilometers from the ocean mouth. But the problem they have is when the currents are working with the tides, they detect saltwater intrusion from the ocean going all the way up 54 kilometers, almost twice as far as they found those sharks. So those sharks were still in brackish water. And where was this other shark at that, uh, that was, you know, this monster pulled out of there? That's 11 kilometers. 5.5 kilometers, or 3.3 3 miles from the opening of the ocean. So, Station 2 here at 11 kilometers never gets less than 6,000 to 8,000 in normal flows. So this thing is flowing like it's supposed to. doesn't get less than 6,000 to 8,000. And that's at the slackest tide with no currents helping. 
and this thing was caught here at 5.5. That is never fresh water. That is closer to ocean water than fresh water all the time. So this thing right here, yeah, it's a river monster. Fresh, no way. Um, that'll do it for the show. I mean, you can Google, just Google salinity in the Breed River and you will see how uh, we were all kind of taken for a ride on that one because uh, it's not true. That is no way in, in no way fresh water. Next week we'll take a look at Gunther and his works. Um, we'll look at a couple of the, either maybe a couple of proofs, sharks being spotted, seen, discovered when they were really caught. We'll look into some of that and we might look into some, some actual uh, recent ones, uh, whether they were, you know, self, self uh, admitted hoaxes or not. We'll look into those. We're going to look into all that. But why? Would you go call this fresh water? I, I, I was on vacation in the Keys for four days and I had done the one episode and I had to dig into all this. And all this is just stuff I've found out in four days. You mean to tell me a television show doesn't have any researchers that can find that, find out that this is not what they called it? <laughs> I beg to differ. So thanks for watching. Um, until next time, we'll see you then. But remember, I, I don't think that you will have to worry about any kind of sharks. Um, when you're in freshwater, other than a true freshwater shark that's in Asia, and it's also one I suspect was in Lake Nicaragua. So we'll get to that next week. Thanks for watching.